your scriptures, if you will, to Romans chapter number 16. Um, we're, we're coming down to the end of conclusion, the book, concluding the book of Romans. Um, the book of Romans is the, Don, I got two on that, sorry about that. The book of Romans is the most important book in the Bible for you and I today. The first book that you tell people that they need to read is not the book of John, it's the book of Romans. The book of, the, of Romans, Romans were the Gentiles in the Bible during the Lord's earthly ministry and during the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And the question is, we're studying the book of Acts in the first session, and, and, and we, we need to know how did God go from dealing with the people of Israel as the head of the nations and not the tail, to now having his salvation of his son to the Gentiles. When we look at our chart here, this is how the Bible is broken up. Time passed, Genesis through Acts, where God is making a distinction in mankind. Once he called out the nation of Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the, he separated the people from, the, Genesis means the beginning, the beginning of mankind. God separated in Genesis 12 the people of Israel in Abraham from all other people, the Gentiles. The people who are in, in Israel's program who are prominent are Moses, the writer of the first five books of your Bible, and then the prophets of Israel, Moses and the prophets. The issue back there in time past with Moses is the law. With the prophets is prophecy, that which God has made known out of the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. We're going to see today the purpose of the Old Testament for today. The Old Testament served a purpose for the nation of Israel in time past. It will serve a purpose for the people of Israel in the future, but that's not what God is doing today. We're going to see, we're going to have Paul let us know what, how to read the Old Testament and how to understand the Old Testament. The issue is the nation of Israel back there. I mentioned when we were doing songs, before the Apostle Paul's salvation, no man ever looked to die and go to heaven. I've been dealing with pastors for nearly 14 years asking him, give me one person before Paul in the Bible who looked to die and go to be with the Lord in heaven. You don't find it. It doesn't happen. Because it was not until the Apostle Paul that you learned that God is doing something in the heavenly places. It's the Apostle Paul who says, our home eternal in the heavens. It's the Apostle Paul who says, the body of Christ will be raptured to the heavens to be up there. Israel will be on the earth. The issue in time past in Genesis through Acts is an earthly kingdom. The Lord came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Daniel says, the God of heaven, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, shall set up an earthly kingdom here on earth that shall never be destroyed and not left to other people, the Gentiles. That's the issue, the gospel of the kingdom. But when you come to the apostle Paul, he says God has a grace gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. That's what God is doing in the present. The book of Romans comes right after the book of Acts. Acts is that bridge that shows the fall of Israel when Saul and those Pharisees committed the unpardonable sin. Acts 7, they, they stoned Stephen, a man full with the Holy, filled with the Holy Ghost. Christ is standing at the right hand of the Father. According to prophecy, when the Son of God stands up here, he's going to judge the nations. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing. Psalm 110 says, sit down on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But instead of coming down to pour out his wrath, according to prophecy, God poured out his grace. He saves the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, the chief opponent, the one who was persecuting Christ and his, 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 his messianic Jewish saints, the apostle Paul. He sends him out. The apostle means sent one with a grace message. How that through the cross of Christ and no works, this is the only dispensation where God does not require works for salvation. The Gentiles are the issue today. Acts chapter 9, 15, the Lord says, he's my chosen vessel to the Gentiles. That's the nations. He has a heavenly kingdom. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And from Genesis 1, verse 2, God has only been dealing with the earth. And the earth was without form and void. God created the people of Israel for the earth. What about the heavens? What about the, the heavens are unclean, Job 15, 15. That's what he created the body of Christ for. I've dealt with members of the church, the body of Christ, and they have no clue why God created them in Christ Jesus unto good works. In the future, you go back to the Hebrews. These are the people of Israel, their race, their, 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 their pure language. It's Abraham's seed. It's the Jewish apostles that are at issue. James says, faith without works is dead. But Paul says, all God requires is your faith. They contradict. Why? Because in Israel's program, the law, performance-based acceptance is the issue. The prophetic program, what God has made known out of the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. 
God is not finished with Israel. He's just doing something temporarily with Gentiles today. And then he's going to set up his earthly kingdom through the Lord Jesus Christ out there in the future in Israel. Look what Paul says, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. As Paul explains salvation through the cross of Christ to you and I today as Gentiles, he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to what? My gospel. Notice Paul didn't say the gospel. Paul says the gospel of the grace of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. That's God's riches at Christ's expense to Gentiles. Christ and the apostles and John the Baptist and in, in, in early Acts, even with the Holy Ghost on those Jews, Jewish apostles, they preached the gospel of the kingdom. How did Jesus Christ would be Israel's Messiah, set up an earthly kingdom? That wasn't the message before Paul. That was the message before Paul. How did Jesus Christ would set up an earthly kingdom? And Peter here says, repent of that evil with the wicked hands of crucifying the Messiah. He's made him to be both Lord and Christ. There's no, there's no blood there. There's no cross work there. It was a wicked thing. When you come to the Apostle Paul and his ministry of grace, the preaching of the cross is the issue. We, were, we glory in the cross of Christ, the blood of Christ. Hebrews the Revelation. That's the issue out here. The future when God is going to deal with that nation. Look what he says. My gospel is the gospel of grace. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 25. I've asked saints for years about this verse. Some have never heard this verse preached on, and that's a shame. This verse is the most important verse in the book of Romans for you and I to understand. Because it says in verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you. How is God going to establish your Christian life? It's according to Paul's gospel. You need to understand, your gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. That's the gospel of grace, the cross of Christ. But not just that, but the preaching of Jesus Christ, how? According to the revelation of the what? The mystery. In line with something that Christ revealed that he kept secret. And we saw that that has to do with how God, through the cross of Christ, would reconcile both Jew and Gentile in one body. He's not going to be dealing with a nation of people called the Israelites. Not in this dispensation. Individual Jews and Gentiles come to God in one body. That's Paul's message. That was a mystery. He kept it a mystery, he says in 1 Corinthians 2, for if Satan would have known this, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He would have let Jesus Christ be the Messiah down here, set up his earthly kingdom, but Satan still would have had the heavenly places. He would have still been the God of the air, the prince of the power of the air, that spiritual wicked and heavenly places. But that's why God, when he's finished with the body of Christ, he's going to take us up there. And the next instant, you, you and I will be at the judgment seat of Christ, and what God is going to judge you on in your Christian life is how much of Pauline doctrine you built up in your soul. How much of that understanding. Look what he says here. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, verse 25, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now watch this. Which was made known since the world began. Kept secret. Kept secret. See, when we talk about prophecy, Peter tells those Jews in Acts 3, that which was spoken about Jesus Christ out of the mouth of all God's holy prophets since the world began. Paul says there's some preaching of Jesus Christ that God didn't make known called the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret, kept secret and made known. It's a polar opposites. Watch what he says here in verse number 26. What's the first two? But now you see this. It's not a secret anymore. It's been in the Bible 2000 years. So why haven't people why aren't every church preaching this? Because there's a satanic policy of evil to hide it. But now is made what? Manifest. God had this thing in the Bible for the last 2,000 years. Why don't they mention it? It is our duty as ministers to preach this message according to the revelation of mystery. But then the question begs, and I get it all the time. Well, Brother Ron, what about the rest of the Bible? Go, go to 2 Timothy chapter. Before you do, look at the rest of verse 26. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. We're going to deal with this issue of the scriptures of the prophets. Paul is making reference to the Old Testament. What about Genesis through Acts? What about all of these? Later is going to be the rest of the Bible here. When Paul wrote this, the Bible wasn't complete. What about the Old Testament? You mean I can't go into 2 Samuel and just pull out verses? I can't go into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and pull out verses to Israel? I can't go into Genesis and pretend like... No, you can't. 
Well, Brother Ron, what about, why is Genesis in there? Well, there's a purpose for it, and we're going to look at that today. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is why Paul writes this passage in 2 Timothy before his death. When God, you ever ask yourself why Paul? The moment I find someone who has a clear testimony of salvation, here's what I mean. If, if you're not trusting a gospel that can save you in two to three minutes. See, when the Jehovah's Witness come to my door, and I, I ask them this, the Mormons, whoever, come. I say, get me saved, get me right with God in two minutes or less. I say, it, you see me on the, on the streets. I get hit by a car, but I'm still alive. My life's blood is flowing out. You come across me. I, I look at you and say, I'm dying. I want to be right with God. Tell me how I can be right with God. See, you can't throw works in there then. Are you perfect? No, brother, I'm not perfect. I'm dying now. Well, there was a perfect one, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again. Believe that and you'll be saved this moment. That's the gospel that saves. And if you don't have a gospel that can save a man dying on the street, you need to just throw away that stuff. This gospel of the kingdom couldn't do it, man. That wasn't the program for a Gentile today. Look what he says here. Go with me, if you will. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 15. Study. This is the only verse in the Bible that tells you to study the Bible and how to do it. Study. To show thyself approved unto your religious leaders. <laughs> Most saints think that. No, no, no. You're going to show yourself approved unto God. How? A workman. That's going to take some labor. That needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of what? James chapter 1. James says in verse 18, having begotten us, the, the people of Israel, by the word of truth. He says, I'm, I speak to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad. James 1.1. 118, he says, we have a word of truth. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, he says, uh, in whom you also trusted, you Gentiles, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. James says, there's a word of God to us Jews. Paul says, there's a word of God to the Gentiles. And that's why when you have this ministry of Paul on the scene in the Bible, what do you think Acts 15 was for? The Jerusalem Council is because they heard this grace message of Gentile grace. Paul was preaching. They didn't, they didn't understand that God, they didn't understand fully that God wasn't doing that Jewish program, and so they came together. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, understood the grace that was given unto me, Paul says, they understood, and they said, look here, Paul, we understand God is sending you out with a new message. And from the salvation of Paul, there are different messages in the scriptures. That's why he says at the end of verse 15, what? Rightly dividing the what? The word of truth. Make the proper right divisions in God's word. God's word is time past, but now and ages come, Ephesians 2. When you're reading Genesis through Acts, you're reading a, a particular time in God's word where he's making a distinction between mankind. Paul says, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. Today, God is not making a distinction. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Your, your racial status, bond nor free, your social status, male nor female, your gender. We all are one in Christ Jesus. That's not the issue out here. The book of Revelation says it matters that you are a Jew. The people of Israel will sit as kings and priests on the earth. That's not the calling of the body of Christ. The body of Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 2, he has set, he has set us, uh, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You need to make that distinction. Look with me, if you will, back to Romans chapter 16. Now, Brother Ron, what's the purpose of the Old Testament? You say, Ron, that the first book that I need to read is the book of Romans. You got that right. You need to understand what the cross of Christ means to you and I as Gentiles. But, Brother Ron, I like the book of John. I, well, read the book of John. Read Romans in the morning. You know, this is, people ask me all the time how I study I read Romans through Philemon. When Paul goes back to the Old Testament, at least I did a long time, I got understand. When he went to the Old Testament, I went and studied that. So he'll talk about Elijah. I I'll tell you what, I'll show you what I mean. You go and read 1 Kings. When he talks about Abraham, you go back to Genesis. That's how you study. 
But let's say you just wanted to read the book of John. Read the book of John. Just understand that the book of John, Paul, the, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That Gentile woman from Cana of Galilee, whose daughter was vexed with the devil, she begged him to heal the daughter, and he walked past her and didn't even acknowledge her. He answered her not a word. Well, why would the Lord Jesus Christ ignore this woman pleading him? I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're a Gentile. She, he called her a dog. It is not meet to take the children's bread, the children of Israel, and cast it to the dogs, the Gentiles. In time past, under the Lord's earthly ministry, the Gentiles didn't have a place. Go over to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. This is important because in order to understand why the Old Testament is important to you and I, we need to make that distinction that it's not speaking directly to us and about us. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11. Ephesians 2 verse 11. By the way, that's why you don't understand the book of Revelation. I haven't met a person who didn't rightly divide, who even come close to understand the book of Revelation. It's not written to you. It's not written about you. It is the commentary on the book of Daniel written to the people of Israel. That knowledge God is going to give them in the future by his Holy Spirit. I don't know one person who don't rightly divide who ever get close to the book of Revelation. And that's no marvel. You can't understand something unless you understand Paul. 2 Timothy 2, 7, Paul says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding of how many things. By understanding the mystery of Christ, what God is doing today, you can understand all the Bible. That's why you rightly divide the scriptures. Look with me, if you will, to Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being where? In time past, Gentiles in the flesh. Now watch how he defines it. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. All right? So time passed. You were Gentiles in the flesh, you, you believers in the body. Paul says, remember this, because you've got to understand God's word. So remember, when you're reading your Bible, when you were Gentiles in the flesh in time past, you were called the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, by that which is called the circumcision. Circumcision was a uh, sign of the covenant given to Abraham and his seed. Okay, Genesis, back in Genesis. Watch this. Verse 12, that at that time, Ye had Christ. Is that what it says? No, the Gentiles were without Christ. It makes sense now that when in Matthew 15, when that Canaanite Gentile woman begged the Lord Jesus Christ for healing, he answered her not a word and kept going. He wasn't being unkind. He's the son of God. But he says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now later, when she took her place in that prophetic program as that Gentile under Israel's dominion out there in the kingdom, she says, yea, Lord, but the dogs get to eat the crumbs. See, the Gentiles get the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. That's out here. God doesn't deal with Gentiles like they're beggars today. Look what he says. At that time, verse 12, ye were without Christ. Why? They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Christ told his apostles, you cannot be my apostles, my disciples, unless you sell all. If you don't sell all that you have and give alms and lay at the apostles' feet and all that, you cannot be my disciple. It was a commonwealth. They shared the wealth. No preachers tell you to sell all that you have today. And if they do, shame on them. Yeah, it's blasphemous. Paul says today, if a man doesn't work, 2 Thessalonians 3, neither shall he eat. That kingdom program says sell all. Why? Let's close the chart. Because that kingdom of heaven was at hand. It was within reach. That's why Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. They sold all, but they kept back apart, and God killed them on the spot. God doesn't do that today. Sell all that you have. Because they were going to go right into that kingdom where he's going to provide for them. That's different than today. At that time, verse 12 of Ephesians 2, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the what? Covenants of promise. People talk about covenant theology. And being part of covenant, God didn't make any covenants with, with no Gentiles. The covenants of God, the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham and his seed, the Mosaic covenant, the law, Israel. I'm going to show you a verse in a minute. The Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the land and the throne and Palestine, all that stuff, all Israel. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. Let's look at a couple of passages. Go to Psalm 147 and Jeremiah 31. 
Aliens from the uh, covenants of promise were Gentiles. Go with me to Psalm chapter 147. I want these verses to be in your mind as you study out God's word. Because without studying the Bible this way, I know you don't understand it. How do I know? Because I got a list of about 200 questions I'm ready to ask anyone who thinks the Bible is not understood this way. I would be an atheist or I would be what I'm doing what I'm doing now. I don't play around with God's word. When I was study, first studying God's word and I got saved, I saw contradictory passages. I didn't try to explain them away. I gave God enough credit. I said, this guy over here contradicts this guy. I trust your word. You need to make it make sense. You said this over there, that if I don't forgive men, neither will you forgive me. But over here, Paul tells me that you've already forgiven me all trespasses. Make it make sense. I didn't play around with the word, and you need not to. Psalm 147 tells, is the answer, number, verse 19. He showeth his word unto who? Jacob's. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have what? Not known them. And then the psalmist says, praise you the Lord. Those Jews, those circumcisions were happy that God didn't give his word to the Gentiles. Paul in Romans 2 says the Gentiles have not the law. That law, that performance-based acceptance was all Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. What I tell you, we was going to go next. Go to Jeremiah 31. What about the new covenant? The law was the old covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31. I mean, all y'all can read a lot better than me. I'm going to tell you that now. But really, if you can read sixth grade English, you can understand the King James Bible. Words do mean something. Watch what the covenant says here. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with everybody. No, it says with the house of who? Israel and the house of Judah. At that time, under the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian captivity. See, Israel had a real kingdom under David and Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all these guys. But it was getting progressively weaker as they disobeyed God's word. Eventually, because they got prideful, God broke the pride of their power and separated the 12 tribes united to 10 tribes northern, 2 tribes southern for David's sake. These guys apostatized under Baal worship, under the tribe of Dan. God kept Judah and, and, and that, that southern region down, down there for David's sake. But even they apostatized. So God says, if you keep going, I'm going to let Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylons, come and take your captivity and destroy the city and the, and the temple and the gates. What well, happened? And, and from that time, it was the times of the Gentiles to the point of the times of the Romans. When Christ came and says, it's time. He says, the time is fulfilled. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ came on a time schedule? Daniel says, there's 70 weeks determined upon thy people in thy holy city to make an end of transgressions and iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Christ says, the time is here. Hey, the times of the Gentiles, the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, Alexander the Great and the Greeks, and then the Romans. Now we know that future is going to be the Antichrist kingdom out of that Roman kingdom. But when Christ came, it was time to give them their kingdom. But look what this says. So he's going to take the two, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 31, house of Israel with the house of Judah, verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which, which my covenant they did what? Break. break. We saw that with Moses. Do you understand why God allowed Moses to break those commandments as he brought them down? God could have stopped them from doing it, but he saw them in apostasy because, remember, they were, just had, they, were, they were just out of Egypt. They still had the worship of Egypt, the worship of false gods and golden calves. They were God's people, but they hadn't renewed their mind. God gave them instruction through Moses. Moses goes up on the mount 40 days, 40 days, gets the commandments written with the finger of God, spirit of God. He comes down. Joshua, by the way, is waiting in the wings. It's beautiful. Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ waiting to take over for Moses. Yeah. Moses would go in that tabernacle and Joshua would be right there, too. It's interesting. Waiting. Jehovah's Savior waiting. The, the, he's a type of the Lord. So Moses comes down. He hears the people. Joshua said, it's the noise of war. He goes, no, 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 not the noise of war. They're having parties down there worshiping gods. And that's what they were doing. Moses sees them. He breaks the Ten Commandments. Boom, right there. God didn't stop it. 
He didn't stop it because that's what mankind does. They can't keep the commandments. He even broke them before they even got it. Do you know that God called Moses right back up that mountain later? Told him, he says, why don't you just hew two more tables and I'm going to write more on there. God wrote the first one. Moses wrote the second one. But it's God's law. It's the, the law of God, the law of Moses. The second time Moses came down, he came down with glory on his face, didn't he? Let me show you what that is. I was checking that out. Forty days with the Lord, he comes down. No glory. The second time Moses went up there, he came down with the new, with the second one, and he had glory. And I was just like, I, it hit me when I was studying. The first time Israel was given the law, God didn't give them the glory, the power to keep it, and they broke it. Israel is going to be keeping the law in the kingdom but it's going to be in their hearts. He's going to cause them, and that's where the glory. So when Moses was coming down the second time, that's a type of Israel keeping his law in the kingdom and being glorified in it. He went up first time, no glory. Second time, glory. Type of keeping the law back here in your own strength, the glory of Christ helping them keep it in the kingdom. See? All of that is a picture of this right here. Verse 33, Jeremiah 31. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of who? Notice that he didn't call them Israel and Judah anymore. He told Ezekiel, you take that one stick and that two sticks, and you put two sticks together, and I'm going to make it one again. God never intended for them to stay separate, Israel and Judah. So I'm going to make it with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law where? In their inward parts. That's where Moses came down with the glory the second time. That, that, that's a type of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in kingdom glory, where he would have Moses' law, God's law, in their hearts. And write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. But don't stop there. Verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, no to who? No. Jews won't be teaching other Jews to know the Lord in that day. If we're in the New Covenant times, why am I teaching people? Why do people teach people to know the Lord? They won't. For they shall all know me, verse 34, from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive them their iniquity. What I want you to see is, go back to Romans chapter number 15. Excuse me, go back to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll get back to Romans 14. The purpose of the Old Testament, we're going to see and in detail today, is to teach you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ, how God dealt with the nation of Israel. The reason those verses are in our Bible, you know, I throw this out every once in a while and it just astounds people. When Paul was sent out to the Gentiles, here, let's go over to the chart here. This is Paul's apostolic journeys. When God sent Paul west to these Gentiles, they didn't have the law. They didn't have God's word. The only word from God that Gentiles had was Paul's epistles. There were synagogues of Jews there. But unless that Gentile happened to go in that synagogue to hear God's word, which some did, but some didn't, a lot of those Gentiles in those Gentile lands had no clue about the law and the prophets. They didn't have the Bible like we have. God would write epistles through Paul, and that would be the epistles that they give to Gentile churches. So think about it. Some, some of the Gentile churches, all they had was just what Paul wrote. And God says, that's enough for now until the word was complete. Look what he says, Ephesians 2, verse 12. You were strangers from the promise, covenants of promise. So all those covenants of promise were for Israel. Having some hope. How, how much hope? What does it mean to have no hope in Scripture? It means you're dying and going to hell. No hope. Hey, if you were a Jew in that day, how would you get saved? Excuse me. If you were a Gentile in that day back here, how would you get right with God? You'd become a Jew. You'd hustle out to the nation of Israel and said, please take me in. They look at you at the gates and they'll say, you're uncircumcised heathen. Well, I want, I'm like Rahab. I believe in the God of Israel. Circumcise me. Okay, come on, circumcise. Keep the law. Okay, you're a Jew. Uriah the Hittite, the guy who David committed adultery with his wife Bathsheba. Uriah the Hittite was a Hittite. He was a Gentile. He got circumcised, he kept the law, he became part of David's army. But I, I think David, who was pure Jew, looked down on that guy a little bit. He's human. And he says, how's this little guy here, who's not even a real Jew, get that pretty old woman 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's a lot there. You look at human nature. David kind of didn't have the right thoughts about Uriah. It's like that old Hittite has this beautiful Jewish princess or, you know, Jewish woman. And he thought he could take advantage. And you saw what happened. Oh, no. They, were, they had no hope. And verse 12, without who in the world? Without the true and living God in the world. They had their idols, little G's, little gods, but not God. But look at verse 13. What's those next two words? But now. But now. Paul explains to us in the body of Christ, whoever would hear, but now, the present, in Christ Jesus, the far off, you Gentiles, are made close, nigh by the what of Christ? The blood. The blood. There's no blood in the preaching of Peter at Pentecost. There's no blood of the pe uh, pre preaching of Peter at, in Acts 3. There's no blood mentioned by all these guys in early Acts. The blood, the, the issue of blood salvation for mankind is not the issue until Paul. Strangely enough, every human being who is right with God from, from Adam on has to have a blood sacrifice. There's not a justified person in any dispensation who, hasn't, who does not have to have shed blood on their... Back here, God shed the first animal for Adam and Eve. Adam taught his sons. One son did it, gave the lamb. The other one didn't, gave the cursed fruit of the ground, came. All these men, they built altars of stone, didn't put any graven tool on it, sacrificed animals. You get to the Mosaic law, he sacrificed animals. Back here with Moses and them, they did it in a tabernacle in the wilderness, temporary tent of skin, type of the Lord. First coming. Out here with David and Solomon, he builds a permanent place of God, the temple, type of the Lord's second coming. Sacrifice blood offering here, sacrifice blood offering here. Israel, when he came, he says, I'm the Messiah. Just like Abraham should have, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. That's what you all are supposed to do to me. The high priest, he went over there in the, on Passover for four days, showed himself a lot, uh, to Israel, said, watch me. Which of you convinces me of sin? I'm the Passover lamb. Look, I'm the Messiah. They were supposed to say, yes, you are. Come on with us, sir, Lord. High priest, take them in there. The Passover, bind the Messiah to the altar of the temple, the place of sacrifice. According to the law, how Moses has been teaching him for 1,500 years, cut him right there, drain his blood, and then take the blood and sprinkle the, cover, the, the, the ark of the cover. All the things, uh, not the ark, but they didn't have it, but the altar, all those things Moses talked about, and waited for God to raise up his son, the Messiah, the third day. But instead of doing that, Paul says they took him and with, uh, Peter says they did it with wicked hands. Paul says they took him and he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. They were supposed to kill him with holy hands of the priest in the temple on the altar. But in unbelief, Israel put him on the cross. But God still was gracious with him, rose him from the dead, gave them another testimony, this time by the Holy Spirit. They committed the unpardonable sin, Matthew 12, blaspheme against the Spirit. Saul was there. He shouldn't have been saved. He blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, which you'll not be forgiven in this world or the world to come, the kingdom. That's why God needed a new dispensation to save the chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul. That's how he saves all of us. All of us are blasphemous sinners before God, before we get saved. But now we have not an animal sacrifice. We have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? Verse 13, Ephesians 2. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh, how? By the blood of Christ. That's the issue today. No more blood sacrifices. It's his blood. The problem out here, when the Antichrist shows up on the scene with Israel, we'll already be in the heavens. We're already raptured out. We're up there serving Christ, serving the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation says, will open up those scrolls there. The Antichrist will be down here on the earth. Making that, renewing that covenant with Israel, rebuilding their temple, began their sacrificial worship, the blood sacrifice. It's an abomination of God. Isaiah 66 says, 2 Thessalonians 2. They do despise to the spirit of grace and the blood of the Son of Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of the, uh, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go back to um, Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. Romans chapter 16, Paul does say, after you learn his gospel. You know, I get a lot of saints who study other, uh, who read and study other passages of scripture outside of Paul, and that's fine. 
But I always remind them, you make sure you understand this stuff first before you try. I have to go in there and kind of correct their thinking because they don't have this down yet. If you don't know where to find the gospel that saves today in your Bible, and I've been dealing with saints, 95% of believers don't know the passage in the Bible that, that's, that, that's the saving gospel. I'm going to test y'all, right? No. First, Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel of the grace of God. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. It's not John 3, 16. By the time you get to John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. You don't need to be a Jew today. This comes after that. He says salvation is of the Jews in John 4, 22. This is the gospel that saves us today, the cross of Christ, the preaching of the cross. It's not, you get the point. It's, that's the gospel. That's where you need to go to take people to show them what the gospel is. Romans chapter 16, that's the first thing you need to know. It, to be established in your Christian life, you need to know what the clear gospel is. The church, the body of Christ as a whole, fails there. The next thing is to know the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. These are the advanced things of the Pauline grace message. Why God created the body of Christ. I ask people, why, Paul, why is Paul even in the Bible? There's no need to have Paul in the Bible. He already had 12 apostles. Let me close the chart. Think about it for a second. He already had 12 apostles who were going to sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the kingdom. Why in the world will he need this guy? And particularly a guy who was persecuting what God was doing. There's no other reason for God to, to put Paul in the Bible except to give you a revelation that God kept secret didn't let any man know until Paul. Twelve apostles for the twelve tribes, one apostle for the one body of Christ. Twelve apostles for the earth, one apostle for the heavens. Look what he says there. Chapter 16, verse 25. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scripture of the prophets. Now, when you're reading the book of John, or the book of Revelation or Hebrews, anything outside of Paul's epistles, let me show you how your mind should be thinking about those passages. You can't just jump in there and say, God said it, it's for me, I apply it to my life, because you know what I, that I know, that if you're honest in your heart, you'll go back here and those verses don't work the way they say they work. I'll be honest. Before I learned right division, I went back there and took Israel's promises put them on me, and they didn't work, and all of a sudden, why God? Well, you got unconfessed sin in your life. No, I don't. I confessed all that sin like they said over in 1 John 5. No, that ain't it. Well, somebody, somebody was preaching the Bible to me, teaching me how to understand the Bible, not rightly divided. Somebody didn't tell me that those promises, when he says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he meant it. And, I and I'm not big enough a day in my life to make God do something that he didn't promise me he would do. If I went to my neighbor's mailbox, opened it up, took their check out of there, woo, thousand dollars, take it down to the bank, I get arrested, man, trying to do that. Spiritual larceny happens all the time in, 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 in churches. God's promises in him are found in, 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 for us in Paul's epistles. You can go and understand what God is doing over there and in the future with Israel, but God's promises to us. How do I know that? You've already tried to listen to Jesus Christ and the Sermon on the Mount and the other promises. Whatsoever you ask for in prayer, believing you receive, you shall have it. And it didn't happen. You prayed all the prayer promises for the healings and deliverance and all those things, and it didn't happen. You know how I know? God's, I trust his word over you. Is it, does it mean God doesn't love you? No, he has a healing program for the body of Christ. It's the spirit of adoption where we get the adoption, the redemption of our body. We get a glorified body, better than anything that he can do over and over and over. Why did God heal Israel supernaturally? It's a sign of the kingdom. Isaiah says, in that kingdom, they shall no longer say, I'm sick. He was giving them a taste of the kingdom where they would never be sick and never die. He raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus was still going to walk in that kingdom had God not changed the program. 
That's rightly dividing the word, okay? Look with me, if you will. Why did God give that Old Testament? We got about 10 minutes. Now watch this. He gave the Old Testament first and foremost to teach us about Israel, his program with Israel. That's why, that's why we have it in the Bible. Second of all, when Paul quotes the Old Testament, it's because there were Jews who knew the Old Testament in the church, the body of Christ. Romans 7, he says, I speak to them that know the law. The body of Christ was made up of both Jew and Gentile. And secondly, when the Old Testament agreed with Paul, agreed with Paul. Now, now notice how I said that. Not Paul agreeing with the Old Testament. A lot of times he didn't. The Old Testament agreed with Paul. Watch this. We're going to just go through a few verses with the time we have left, and then I'll take questions after, but you need to know this. Go back to the book of Romans chapter 1. Paul starts off the book of Romans speaking about this very thing as the Gentile apostle. Romans chapter 1. Look with me at verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Watch the parentheses which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It's the Old Testament. God, the gospel of God, has to, has the good news of the resurrection of Messiah, the Son of God. The Scriptures through Moses and the prophets kept talking about resurrection of Messiah. That's the good news. All the good news in all the Bible is centered on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it starts and ends in the mind of God, okay? Every dispensation. So he says, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of who? David. So if I'm studying, when I first start studying, I say seed of David. Then I go back to 2 Samuel 7, read about the covenant. Oh, yeah, David, a covenant. There's Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, bam, there it is. When Paul goes back there, you go back there. According to the flesh. So there's his humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ was the God man. He, he was human. He was the seed of David. He's going to be the son of God sitting on David's throne. Verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power. Here's his deity. According to the spirit of holiness, he, set, he was set apart totally for God's purpose in the earth by the resurrection from the dead. You see that? When Paul talks about Jesus Christ, it is the same person that the scriptures talk about. You can go back and read Moses and, and Samuel and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's that Jesus. It's just that when Peter talks about Jesus, he's talking about the earthly Jesus of Nazareth in his humanity. Not his humanity, in his earthly ministry on earth. When Paul talks about Jesus according to Revelation of Mystery, he talks about the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory that he saw on the road to Damascus. That's why one is according to prophecy made known. One is according to the mystery, kept secret. Same Jesus, just a different preaching of him. Go with me, into, if you will, to Romans 4. I'm just finishing this up. Romans 4, look at verse 3. For what saith the what? Scripture. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Paul quotes uh, Genesis chapter 15 and showed that before Abraham was this circumcised guy that the Jews keep talking about, and the Muslims too, by the way. God, God justified Abraham by faith alone. No works, by the way. James uses Abraham as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example of a righteous man in Israel by works. Wasn't Abraham's works made him justify James too. Paul, that's just Genesis 22. Paul goes seven chapters back, seven, number perfection, to Genesis 15 before circumcision when he was a Gentile heathen from Iraq. Abraham was from Ur to Chaldees. He was an Iraqi. He believed God, then he got the circumcision. How can a person really know that that happened? Because you go back and read the book of Genesis. There you go. As Paul is trying to show us that God really only accepts faith and no works, he goes way back to the Old Testament to the man who's Abraham, to the man who is the picture of faith in the Bible, and it agreed with what Paul says. But mind you, James does the same thing with the Israelites. He takes them back to Genesis and shows their father Abraham, but he'll use Genesis 22 
where he had to do a work by sacrificing Isaac. Two different programs there. One is by grace alone, no works. One is by faith plus works, okay? All right, look at chapter 9, if you will. We're just going through these verses as, as time goes down. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Paul does this all the way through. For the scripture saith unto who? Pharaoh. It's interesting, the scripture said unto him. It was really God through Moses through Aaron. I think sometimes we'll say Moses speak to Pharaoh, but he didn't. Moses didn't want to talk because he had a, a, a speech impediment. God could have let him talk. God is the one made the tongue. But he says, okay, for you, here's your brother Aaron. He'll be, you'll be God. He'll, he'll be your prophet. God spoke to Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron. Aaron spoke to Pharaoh. Aaron had just come out of Egypt. He, he knew both languages, Hebrew and, and, and Egyptian. You go back to Genesis. So Paul would use Genesis again to show some things. It agreed with what Paul is saying about the nation of Israel. Keep going. Go to chapter 10. Look at verse 11. Romans chapter 10, verse 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul is dealing with, with Jewish people. He's like, God, he dealt with, your, with our people back then. He's not dealing with our people in chapter 10, but he will deal with our people again in chapter 11. He's not done. He just put us on hold. And he kept going back to the scripture because he say, see, it agrees with what I say. Romans chapter 15. I showed this verse to a brother the other day. He says, Ron, when I'm reading the Old Testament, why am I reading it? If Paul's epistles are for us, I said, when he says rightly divide, that means he's assuming you're reading the Old Testament. Read all of God's word. Just understand where you fit in. Watch what he says in Romans 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Learning. Well, what are you going to learn? That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have what? Hope. When you read about how God is faithful to the nation of Israel back there, you say, well, Lord, if you're faithful to them, and then now that we have all the Bible, he's going to give them their kingdom. Even in the future, he's going to be faithful. You know that the promises he made you and I through Paul's epistles, he will, he will do. I told my wife and mom, they'll testify some things. Was going. There's never been a time where the Lord has let us down when we trust him with patience. Patience is waiting without complaining. The biggest thing you need to have as a believer today is patience. If you take a Pauline promise from God, give it to him and ask him to be faithful to it, he will just be patient. He's working it out. He always comes. He's never let me down. I trust his word through Paul. <clears throat> Patience and comfort of the scriptures. That's what it's saying. It might have hope. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. There were a lot of Jews in the, in, the, in the churches of Corinth, Jews and Gentiles. Look what he says in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant, you should be ignorant, how that our fathers, there's the Jews, as Paul deals with those Jews in the body, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat, that was the manna, and all did drink that same spiritual drink, that was the water out of the rock, for, that, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? That was the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a type of him. Verse 5. But with many of them, that's those Israelites in the wilderness, God was not what? Well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So when we go and read the book of Exodus, and we see God, how he dealt with that nation, his attitude towards sin, and, and idolatry and unbelief, basically, it's all unbelief. We can read that in Exodus. That's what I did this week, just read that and said, oh yeah, that's, boy, I don't want us to be like them. Watch what he says in the next verse. Verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things were our what? Examples to the intent that we, that's members of the body, should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. See that? When you're reading Exodus, you see what God did with Israel. He's not going to do that to you today in that manner. Today, it's the law of the harvest. Galatians 6, when you sin like they did, God, he created evil on them. It's so funny. 
God will say in Isaiah, I heard some guys do a whole seminar on the fact that God said he created evil, and they were trying to explain it away. He did create evil for Israel, Isaiah. I think Isaiah 45. He says, I am the Lord God. I create good, I create evil. And they were like, oh, what does that mean? It means because Israel was under the law, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, when they were good, God blessed them. When they were evil, he created evil for them. God don't create evil and jump on you today. The law of the harvest says, whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 6. If you sow to your flesh today, God in time and patience will let your flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit of God, which is the grace message, you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law, you reap life everlasting. If your life's a mess today, whether in your mind, your thinking, your soul, your, your, your circumstances, and all these things, I, I, when, I, when I counsel people, I get to the root of the problem, they're not listening to Paul. 13 and a half years, that's the answer right there. They're not listening to Paul. And the way they done sold so many bad seeds trying to listen to God, speak to Israel, and taking their verses, and their, their life a mess, and their understanding is a mess. They're on a religious treadmill, running hard, going nowhere fast, and, it's, and that's the simplicity of it right there. They, they, they're not in the right doctrine. Sowing and reaping is how God deals with Gentiles today in the body of Christ. With Israel, he created evil. Look what he says here, chapter 10, verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters. Idolater means you, you made something else your God. You can do that as a believer, by the way. As were some of them. As it is written. Now notice how Paul quotes the Old Testament. This is Exodus. The people sat down. Or it could be in Numbers. The people sat down, it's in both actually, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed or destroyed serpents. Neither murmur ye, that's complain, as some of them also murmured or complained and were destroyed or the destroyer. Now watch verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for what? No, in samples. Uh-huh. Oh, that caught you. That King James Bible, I told you those words, in sample and example. Yeah. Remember that. It happened to them as in samples. It's like a sample of the whole. Earlier he said it happened to us. I mean, it, as we watch Israel, is the example. We're going to end here. That's two different words. Israel, if you're within that, that nation of Israel, when, what God did to punish them, that's an end sample. That's from the inside. We Gentiles looking back, it's our example. See that King James Bible, man? It'll teach you some, some doctrine. When God punished Israel back there in Numbers and, and Exodus and all that, the people of Israel were supposed to learn it was their end sample, a sample of what God would do with them. It's our example. Look what he said there. Verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and, so it's to teach them back then, and they are written for what? Our admonition, that's a warning. Notice those are two people in that verse. You got the people of Israel, they're in sample, because they're within there. We read that stuff in the Old Testament, we go, oh, wow, God don't really like that. And he warns us through how he dealt with them that he doesn't like sin, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That issue of the end of the world are come, this is, when Paul, when Paul was saved, God was wrapping up his program with mankind. See, from that time, mankind been having his way. The Lord came, Paul came, once this thing is over, God is about to have his day. So we're going to conclude here. I just want you to see that the purpose of the Old Testament today is not for you to go back here in Genesis and Acts, through Acts, and get your doctrine. Now that the Bible is complete, we'll look at one more verse. You have the future, but it's still Israel. Go with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's end there, 2 Timothy 2. In 2 Timothy 2, make it chapter 3, before Paul died, the last man to see the Lord Jesus Christ in a vision was the Apostle Paul. 
I don't care what Benny Hinn says. I don't care what any of them dudes on TV says that they got a vision from the Lord. They did not see the Lord. Paul says, Colossians 2, they vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind, speaking of things they have not seen. No man saw the Lord Jesus Christ after the apostle Paul. He's God's apostle to the Gentiles. Don't be bamboozled. They're doing that to get your money. 2 Timothy 3, Paul puts the capstone of God's word down and says, now that I'm dying, Timothy, you have something to trust. I'm leaving. The Lord's up in heaven, but you got something to trust. 2 Timothy 3, we'll end in verse 15 and 16. 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who did, who did Timothy learn the doctrine from? Paul. And that from a child. Remember, Timothy was about 30 years younger. Timothy's parents, uh, mother, excuse me, and his grandmother taught him the Pauline message. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All what? Scripture. scripture holy writ. The written word of God is given by inspiration, God breathe, of God. And it's profitable for what? Doctrine. That's your particular teaching. There's different doctrines in the Bible. There's the Mosaic doctrine. There's the Pauline doctrine. There's the Jewish doctrine. The, the apostles. Different, doc, different teaching. Reproof. He'll correct your conduct. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, he'll deal with your conduct. Correction. That deals with your thinking process. Give you the right thinking. For instruction in righteousness. You want to know how to be right? It's all scripture. Watch this. Verse 17. That the man of who? God. That's just not the individual. The man of God is a term. That's the body of Christ as well. We, we're the body of Christ. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Remember Paul talks about those spiritual gifts over in 1 Corinthians 13? He says, whether there be tongues, they shall fail. Gift of tongues. Whether there be prophecies, they shall what? Cease the gift of prophecy. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The gift of knowledge, all those spiritual gifts he gave earlier. For I know in part, for I prophesy in part, but when that which is what is come, perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. That's not Jesus Christ. That's the word. Paul wrote Corinthians way back here, and over the course of 30 years, God was giving him visions and revelations, and he wrote it down. Look what he says in verse 17, that what the scriptures will do. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Truly furnished unto how many good works? All good works. Now that we have the completed word of God rightly divided, there's nothing else you need from God to do what he tells you to do. But before you get to 2 Timothy 3, you have to read 2 Timothy 2.15, which is to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Are you going to be that workman? Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're here today and, and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's where it starts, Paul's gospel. If no one ever loved you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you spend eternity? I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. And Paul says that God commended his love and demonstrated and proved his love to us and that while we were yet what? Sinners, Christ died for us. If you ever want to know whether God loves you, if you ever want to in the future say, God, do you love me? He says, look at the cross. God stepped into time and eternity, from, from eternity into time, in the person of his son, shed his precious blood for your sins and mine. And in the dispensation of grace, by simple faith in that alone, no works. This is the only place where God didn't require works. He required works in Israel's program here. He's going to require works again out there. But today, no works. Let's any man should boast. If you haven't trusted Christ, trust them now. Right where you sit, you don't have to move a muscle, pray a prayer, walk an aisle, give a tithe, go to church. You don't have to do anything. Don't do anything. Just believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That moment, God will forgive you all your sins. He'll give you eternal inheritance in the heavenly places and give you eternal life for, for a possession right now. All Eternity is how long? Forever. You got his life forever. And if you're out there and, and you don't understand the Bible this way, you're in trouble. 
You're going to be ashamed and you're teaching the Bible because you're going to run into somebody like me who I don't deal and dabble with God's word, never did. That's my mother back there. She thought I was crazy going to the other side of Chicago to hear some guy talk about this. I said, Mother, this is what keeps me from being an atheist because all those guys out there don't make the Bible make sense. This dude do, and he was preaching the word rightly divided. You need to get off that religious treadmill of confusion. Stop playing with God's word. You need to be attending a Pauline dispensational Bible study. That's why we're here to rightly divide God's word and preach the message of grace. I don't care if you just got saved now, because I'm talking to people on the internet. Let us know if you did. But if you've been saved 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, this is where you need to be. This is the information that you're going to be judged on out there. Let us pray.